Welcome to our third Sunday sermon, and whether you're listening to this on a Sunday or not, today we're going to be diving into the topics of faith and trust. We're going to talk about spirals as a symbol and the spiral nature of life. And so this is episode number 186 of the Untame the Wild Soul podcast. If you're new here, I'm your host, Elizabeth Dialto. And if you want a link to anything that I mention that we use here in this episode, you can head on over to untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 186. So to begin, the purpose of Sunday sermons is to be bite-sized, digestible, juicy, beautiful morsels of inspiration, of soul connection, to give you something to be with going into your week, whether it provides an insight that you could use, a revelation, a deeper connection to yourself. Maybe it confirms something that's already been up for you. We talk about synchronicity a lot around here at the Untame the Wild Soul podcast. So maybe something's been up for you. And then miraculously, it's the core topic of the Sunday sermon. I don't know, but I definitely would love to know. So after you listen to this, if you want to find me on Facebook or Instagram and let me know what came up for you, if you loved it, if it was triggering for you, I always want to know all the things. So find me on those places, but let's get into it. Let's begin with a prayer. And this isn't a written prayer. I'm just going to make it up because that's how I like to pray. But Holy Mother, Father God, divine creators of all there is, whose essence is within us and in all things, use us, move us, and make us all forces for expansion, for love, and for good. May we connect on a regular basis with our own creativity. May we be kind. May we see and receive the love, beauty, and expansion in the world. May we be receptive. May we be abundant. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. Let us remember that we're part of a big human family. And just like in our own families, we don't always love the way other people behave. But that doesn't mean that we need to be too influenced by it. We could be inspired to take action, to do things, to speak up, to create more of what we want to see in the world. Give us the drive and give us the resolve and the courage to say and do better than we've done before, to say and do better than those who we judge as doing poorly or badly so that we can spread love, so that we can spread light and that we can connect with our own truths and be about what we believe in. May we be role models May we be influencers, may we be leaders in our day-to-day lives on whatever scale that is by shining our own light, by standing in our own truth, by being in our own power. May our presence and may our existence permit others to do the same. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. May we stay appreciative. May we move out of the way and create space for grace to come through. Thank you so much and amen. So I want to talk about spirals today. And it's so interesting how this topic came up. Spirals are something I talk about pretty regularly. It comes up. It's an interesting symbol in my life. Those of you who listen to the podcast have heard me talk about thought spirals or the way how growth happening over time is like a spiral, right? Sometimes we're spiraling. It feels like we're spiraling up. Sometimes it feels like we're spiraling down and we're making backwards progress, but we're never actually going backwards. Like I have women in my programs who will sometimes say, I feel like I'm right back where I started. And they say that when they're facing the same issue or a similar issue. 
And what I love about the symbolism of the spiral is that the spiral reminds us that we might be facing the same or a similar issue, but we're coming at it from a different perspective with a different set of skills, tools, a different level of compassion for ourselves, different context. Perhaps there's different people involved in it. Maybe we have a higher perspective. Maybe we are in some kind of trauma spell, like my friend Rachel Maddox calls it. And so how we're responding to the thing really depends on where we are in this spiral related to the thing. And so everything is progress. We're literally never back in the same exact spot we were because so many things have transpired between the last time we found ourselves there and this current time. So instead of beating yourself up to be facing an issue again or in the same situation with a person again or you know whatever it is, we get to have grace and zoom out a little bit and say, okay, I'm now in this position again or in this relationship again or facing this thing again. What is different from last time? This is always a great opportunity to measure backwards and look at how you used to respond to things like this and how you're going to respond to it now. What do you know now that you didn't know before? What level of emotional intelligence or literacy or maturity do you have that you can use to navigate this in a higher way, in a more useful way, or maybe in a more gentle way, maybe in a more intelligent way? Do you have awareness now that you didn't have before? You might have consciousness now that you didn't have before. And so more options are available to you than they were before. And that in itself means it's, it's not the same thing. So please remember that so you don't beat yourself up. In terms of thought spirals, this is one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of mantras. Mantras just being repetitive thought forms, right? Because whether you are using a positive mantra or a useful or a sacred mantra. Maybe you go to a yoga class and they give you a Sanskrit mantra, or maybe you do some of our wild soul movement exercises and it's a simpler mantra focusing on a concept like it is safe for me to let go or I am enough or something like that. Mantras, negative mantras are things that we don't even realize. Any thought that you repeat to yourself consistently and repetitively. So if you think that you're not enough or you're not worthy or you're going to mess something up or you're doubting or questioning yourself, asking yourself, am I doing this right? Should I have done something differently? Should I ask for help? If we have these constant and persistent thoughts, that's essentially a mantra. So that is creating the vibration. That is creating the reverberation. That is going out into the world and bringing an experience back to you, basically creating and manifesting experiences to reflect to you what you've been thinking about. And so this is why I love mantras. And this is why mantras aren't bullshit. Some people think like, oh, mantras are affirmations. That's bullshit. But here's the really cool thing. So your consciousness, your mind is divided into three different things. You have your conscious mind, which is, you know, your limited intelligence. It's still quite vast, but it's limited by only what we can see and perceive, what's right in front of us, what we've learned, what we know to be true, what we have validated in our life experience um, or learned from others or have modeled for us. So that's our conscious mind. It's very limited. Then we have our subconscious mind, which is far more vast and it's it's trainable it is influenceable is influenceable is that a word you know what i mean though right and so the conscious mind can be impressed and so this is why we use things like mantras and affirmations because that repetition impresses something on the subconscious mind so and brings it into our conscious mind as we are impressing it. So whether it's a repetitive mantra or you're using an affirmation or you're visualizing something, all of these things can shape and form and impress 
the subconscious mind so that in our conscious world, we can actually expand what we have access to. And then there's the super conscious mind, which that is the God mind. That's like infinite intelligence. Anything and everything is possible um, beyond imagining. And so when we're having any kind of thought, the beautiful thing about listening to shows like this or reading books that talk about these things is it expands and increases your awareness so that you're better able to notice in the moment when your thoughts are spiraling downward or in a negative way or an unproductive or unuseful way. And then you can choose, right? Your thoughts don't have to be like a runaway train. You can choose your thoughts. You can choose something to interrupt the negative spiral. You can choose something to spiral back into or towards a direction that's going to be more useful, helpful, productive, loving, gentle, compassionate, inspirational, things like that. So we can look at our life experience as a spiral. We can look at our thoughts as spirals because these things really don't have to be linear. And so this brings us to the conversation I wanted to have around faith and trust. I've been deconstructing trust a lot lately, a lot lately, <laughs> lady. <laughs> it makes sense because a lot of my faith has to do with connecting to the Divine Mother so that 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 the big lady, the biggest lady of them all, sneaking herself into the conversation there, a little Freudian slip. And so I'm always so curious about the relationship between things. So something I have said before is that faith is like trust on steroids. And I love refinement. So I want to refine that. Faith to me feels macro. When you have faith, you have faith in something bigger um, and more wide sweeping. So a philosophy, faith in life itself, you know, that life is supporting you, faith in, in a God or the universe or whatever divine being, deity, larger force than you that you put your faith in if you do that, which I doubt you'd be listening to this if you didn't. Faith in belief, belief systems, in big ideas, in dreams or concepts, or maybe it's faith in people. So this is a bigger, bigger concept, right? Farther sweeping, not that the concept itself is bigger, but faith itself as a noun is bigger, right? To have faith in something. So faith is a noun. Faith exists, Trust, however, is a verb. Trust is a constant action. And the constant choice and act of trust actually builds our faith. So there's such an interesting, we talk about spirals. These two really spiral and feed into each other. Trust to me feels more micro though. So it's more on the day-to-day -day details, on the individual more nuanced level. So... Faith breeds trust because when you have faith in something bigger, you can trust in the day to day and in yourself as things arise. And, you know, I've said this many times that trust is the opposite of control. But if we're going to talk about releasing control, we also have to talk about surrender. So there's kind of three things happening here because surrender is really the opposite of control. However, Trust is required to surrender. So I'm imagining this flow chart or even this funnel where faith is at the top and it's bigger and it brings with it a momentum and a power that fuels into trust, that fuels into surrender, right? Because we need faith in order to trust and we need trust in order to surrender, and sometimes we need to surrender to get back to trust. And sometimes in taking those little trusting acts along the way, we are building our faith. So it's really this amazing symbiotic relationship between faith and trust and surrender. So that is what I want you to go into your week contemplating. How can you expand your faith? How can you choose acts of trust in the day-to-day? -day? How can you surrender so that you can trust more, so that you can continue building your faith? So instead of doing an oracle reading or anything like that, to wrap up here, 
I'm holding in my hand The Gift, poems by Hafez, who is a great Sufi master. And so I'm going to read one. I'm going to literally flip through the book with the intention that whatever poem I land on is somehow or somewhat relevant to what we were talking about today. And then I'm going to read you the poem and we're just going to wrap up. So, oh, it's a little bit of a long one. Here we go. It's called What Happens to the Guest? The hand sat in the classroom of the eye and soon learned to love beauty. The sky sat in the classroom of God and now look what it gives us at night, all that it learned. There was a time when man was so burdened with survival that he rarely bathed in dancing sounds. But dear ones, now drop your pointed shields that wound. What happens to the guest who visits the house of a great musician? Of course, his tastes become refined. There are some who can visit the luminous sphere that reveals this life never was. The truth of that experience is reserved for so very few. God draws back like a kite some of those who get lost in the sun. And after their recovery from being sublimely independent, having known the unspeakable union, they might try again with all their courage to sing a simple tune like this. What happens to the guests who keep visiting the verse of a perfect one? Their voices and cells become refined, and like the soft night candle, the moon, they begin to give this world all the light they have learned. Your hand sits in the classroom of God. An apprentice as Hafez was mastering the craft of divine beauty as the earth spits on the potter's wheel. So I'm not going to deconstruct that. I'm not going to share how I felt that landed for me. I want you to sit with that, re-listen to it maybe, look it up and see what lands for you. Thank you so, so much for listening. Again, this was episode number 187. So if you want to find the link to that book, head on over to untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 186. And you know what? We'll actually type out, we'll write out the poem for the show notes as well. So if you just want to go straight there to see that poem, we've got it there for you on the show notes page. Have a beautiful week. Thank you for listening. If you know someone who could really use some faith, trust, or surrender this week, go ahead and send this Sunday sermon over to them so they can enjoy it too. See you later.